declare my interest in coal, but also in renewable energy, wind and wood in particular. Uh, I am genuinely shocked by the casual way in which the other place nodded through this statutory instrument on Monday, committing future generations to vast expenditure to achieve a goal that we have no idea how to reach technologically without ruining the British economy and the British landscape. We are assured without any evidence that this measure will have, and I quote, no significant impact on business. But where is the cost-benefit analysis on which this claim is based? Where is the impact assessment? They do not exist. We are told the Treasury will run exercise in costing these proposals after we have passed it. But that is irrational, my Lords. Who amongst us in our private lives says, yes, we will sign a contract to buy a house, and only after the ink on the purchase is dry will we try and find out the price of the house? My Lords, where we are, where, where are, uh, no, my Lords, I have lost my place. Uh, <laughs> We are faced with a measure which is likely to cost at least a trillion pounds on top of the £15 billion a year that we are now spending on subsidies to renewable energies. Let's remind ourselves just how big a sum a trillion pounds is. If you spend a pound a second, it would take you 30,000 years to get through a trillion pounds. You would have to start before the peak of the last ice age, when woolly mammoths and Neanderthals roamed across a tundra where we now sit. And now we are talking about spending £1,000 a second for the next 30 years? Yet the Committee on Climate Change says the cost will be even higher. It assumes that UK GDP will have almost doubled from about £2 trillion to about £3.9 trillion a year in 2050, and that we will have been spending 1 to 2 per cent of GDP every year between now and then. My Lords, that means we will have spent between 30 and 60 billion pounds a year for 30 years. That comes out at 900 to 1.8 trillion pounds. 900 billion to 1.8 trillion pounds. That number has recently been described in this debate as uh, manageable and affordable by the noble Lord Lord Grantchester. It has been described as nickel and dime by, by the noble Lady Baroness Worthington. But hang on a minute, where does the Committee on Climate Change get this estimate of 1 to 2 per cent of GDP? On behalf of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, to which I am proud to be an unpaid scientific advisory panel member, Andrew Montford has been trying to find out how the CCC reached this cost estimate, and he has got nowhere. He has been referred to many documents which repeat or otherwise restate this, this number, but none to act that actually calculate it. He has referred to a statement which, which gives 1.3 per cent of GDP as an estimate as the sum of the resource cost, yet there is no breakdown of the resource cost. My noble friend Lord Deben says it is all set out in detail. In fact, it is not. It is impossible to get at how this calculation has been arrived at. Um, it is important to note, by the way, that these 0.9 to 1.8 trillion uh, pounds is arrived at by comparing hypothetical policy scenarios anyway. So this allows the Committee on Climate Change to soften the overall cost of decarbonisation by netting off energy efficiency savings. But these would be pursued anyway, so it's not, it's not right to do that. And the CCC also ignores the deadweight loss of tax, from taxes and subsidies, which are likely to be a significant extra cost. Well, in any case, let me give you, Lordships, an example of just how much of an underestimate this 1 to 2 per cent of GDP might prove to be. Take hydrogen. The Committee on Climate Change places great emphasis on hydrogen. It mentions its need, its need in electricity, in heating, in buildings and in industry. It thinks that we will need to burn about 8 billion kilograms of hydrogen a year by 2050. It estimates that 80% of this hydrogen would have to come from reformed natural gas. So, when you take process losses into account, we would actually end up by significantly increasing both our fossil fuel consumption and, of course, our emissions all of which would make carbon capture and storage absolutely indispensable to this net zero ambition, as I and others have said in the past. But where are the constructive plans to do this at a reasonable cost? Silence. If the environmental movement is really serious about zero emissions, then it must either embrace nuclear power or cap carbon capture. Renewables and behaviour change won't work. One is physically impossible because of low energy density, and the other is politically impossible. Most British homes are heated with gas. To replace that with electricity and bring all British homes up to the most energy efficient standard would cost around £2 trillion, according to the Energy Technologies Institute. £2 trillion on homes alone. Um, 
Now, what will be achieved by all this spending? We won't tr stop floods, droughts or storms happening. Uh, they will always happen. We'll still have to deal with flooding, uh, even if we get emissions to zero. Nor is the purpose of these plans to bring down global emissions. We've no hope of that. We're 1% of global emissions, and others are glad to export to us from their low energy cost uh, economies. So we'd mainly be exporting our emissions and living the good green life on China's fossil fuels. So the only remaining purpose of this measure, and we've heard it again and again here today, is to set an example to the world, to be the shining city of virtue on a hill. My lords, who are we kidding? When the Prime Minister goes to the G20 meeting this weekend and asks for others to follow suit, she's going to get very few takers. Japan has just announced another 20 gigawatts of coal-fired power stations. The EU has already rejected this exact target uh, since this order was placed. America, Australia, Brazil, China, India, none of them are going to pay the slightest attention to what we do here today. My lords, this is not soft power, it's soft in the head. There are real environmental problems in this world. The overfishing of the oceans, plastic pollution, invasive alien species, the conservation of the curlew and the red squirrel in my part of the world. They are urgent. They are important. They need money, but a pittance compared with the sums we're talking about. Yet they're starved even of that pittance because of the coalition of preachers and profiteers that have climbed on the climate bandwagon and demanded a, limit, a limitless budget. My Lords, we need to look at these costs alongside the cost of doing nothing, that is to say the cost of damage by climate change. That's called the social cost of carbon. Uh, it's an estimate of the total harm done by emissions now and brought forward from the future. That metric is not mentioned in this order or in the Climate Change Committee report. The best guess in the scientific literature at the moment is that the social cost of carbon is about $45 a tonne, which is roughly the number that the Obama administration was using. I would like to ask my noble friend, the Minister, what is his department's estimate of the social cost of carbon? And I would also like to ask him what his, his estimate, his department's estimate, of the abatement cost per tonne of the net zero ambition. Because once we know those numbers, we can know whether or not we're getting value for money with this expenditure. Um, because otherwise we might be committing to a climate policy that is actually more harmful and costly to human and planetary well-being than climate change itself, which would surely be irrational. My Lords, I fear that hasty and ill-supported commitment making of this kind is the, thing, is the kind of thing that provokes judicial review. The government should pause and think this through and do a proper cost-benefit analysis before it, it commits to this policy. And before I sit down, I'd, I'd like to address some of my noble friend Lord Deben's remarks, because some years ago the Committee on Climate Change published on its website an attack on me personally, claiming to refute some points I had made in this House. It did not have the courtesy to inform me that it was doing this, and it refused to tell me who had written it. It contained material inaccuracies and a quotation from an IPCC document that had been doctored to remove a critical clause which confirmed the accuracy of my remarks. I pointed this out to my noble friend, but he refused to correct the errors. So I shall take no lessons in accuracy from my noble friend. <laughs>